Welcome back to Nature League. As I'm filming this, we are heading into the last parts of September of 2020. And to be honest, things are hard right now. They are difficult, they are exhausting. Jane definitely helps, but suffice to say, things are difficult. And a lot is hard to process and you know, it's hard to stay focused and to stay motivated. <laughs> One thing that helps me when I'm feeling this way, besides a good cuddle session from this one, is definitely finding inspiration from other species and types of life on Earth. I like to remind myself that other species are all in this struggle for existence every day, and we are not in it alone. The brilliance, resilience, and just existence of other life on Earth definitely raises me up when I'm feeling down. And so I figured I would share some of that with all of you in this video. That's right, it's time to sift through the headlines and find some exciting and cool stories that talk all about the fascinating things happening with life on Earth right now. Thank you, kissies. Thank you. Oh, thank you, kissies. Okay, thank you. Before we start, it is important to note that the news about life on Earth right now is not all good. In fact, the United Nations just came out with its latest biodiversity outlook assessment, and we are going to definitely unpack that in a video that will come out soon. For this video, I've specifically found news and articles from this past month that highlight interesting findings and general awesomeness from other species of life on Earth. This is with the hopes that we can ultimately take a little breather and remember that our world is ultimately amazing. First up is a fascinating story all about baboons, stress, and social rank. Not gonna lie, this article didn't exactly jump out at me because of baboons, though baboons are super cool, but it was actually the idea of stress and social hierarchies. And not gonna lie, this actually reminded me of a major problem I had with Game of Thrones. I know, it seems like a tangent, but just hang with me for one minute. The entire time I was watching Game of Thrones, I just kept wondering why on earth anyone would even want the throne, because honestly, it really just seemed like a good way to be killed or definitely have people trying to kill you. In general, like, it did not seem like a good time. So I just had trouble understanding the motivations of these people trying to get said throne. Basically, just seemed like a constant state of stress, which, you know, doesn't seem like a good motivator for power, but there we are. Now in this article about these baboons, the researchers actually found something a little bit opposite from this. To explore the relationship between stress and social hierarchy, the team looked at the fecal concentrations of glucocorticoids in a group of baboons. Glucocorticoids are a type of hormone that is released as a stress response in vertebrates. Scientists have found and studied the relationships between the levels of these hormones and social rank or dominance in birds, fish, and other mammals. I mean, you know, if you've ever been to middle school, you absolutely know that social rank is definitely related to stress levels. But by looking at glucocorticoid levels, this group of researchers could get even deeper into this connection. Okay, I'm gonna just get my, can I have my arm back? Please? I'm just gonna, thank you. Yep. Yeah. okay, great. In this group of baboons that were studied, the researchers found that alpha females actually had the lowest levels of glucocorticoids. This might be because alpha females in this group tend to hold on to their rank for a really long time. In fact, some alpha females will actually reign or be at the top for eight years or longer. It could also be that life at the top of this social ladder is less stressful because there's not another baboon above them to push them around, either literally or figuratively. So hey, it might just be the case that it's good to be the king, or one of the queens, at least in this group of baboons. Still does not explain Game of Thrones to me, but you know what? I'm gonna leave it alone. For now. For now. Up next is some fascinating news about a tree in Australia. Now, when you think about Australia and biodiversity, the word venom might come to mind. And if it does, you are not wrong. Australia is home to some of the most venomous animals on the earth, everything from the fierce snake to the box jellyfish. But Australia's venom does not stop at the animal kingdom. That part of the world is also home to venomous plants. And I do mean venomous instead of poisonous. As a quick refresher, a species is poisonous if it's toxic when consumed or touched. 
Think about uh, poison glands on a cane toad, for example. A species is venomous if it can inject its toxin, either by a fang or a spike or a nettle. Basically, from the human perspective, if it can pierce my skin and give me the bad stuff, that's venomous. In this study, scientists were studying Australian stinging trees. That's right, stinging trees. Now, these species of stinging trees are absolutely incredible. They can grow up to 35 meters or 114 feet. Despite their beautiful aesthetics, these trees are actually known for their excruciating stings that can cause pain lasting from days up to even weeks. All right, so how are these trees venomous exactly? Well, it's not that they have hidden fangs, though that would be super rad. It is instead that they have these special structures called trichomes. Trichomes are shaped like needles, and they're able to inject or give some of the toxins from inside when they are brushed. And these molecules can activate nerves at the time of being stung and later on. So the venomous part was solved. But the mystery that remained was why does it hurt so bad? These stings are known for being exceptionally painful. And this led scientists to wonder what exactly these molecules were that were causing so much pain. In this study, the researchers were able to define a previously unknown group of peptides that they wound up calling gimpetides. Tides because of the peptides bit, and then gimpy because of the actual local name of some of these trees, which is gimpy gimpy. The primary structure of these gimpy tides is unique to current knowledge, but it turns out that the higher level organization of these peptides has actually been seen before in both spiders and cone snails. And yes, classic Australia to have a venomous snail. The team also found that these gimpetides affect sodium channels, which makes these molecules the first ever described that do these kinds of things from a plant. Due to similarities in structure and also function, that means that these gimpetides actually represent a cross kingdom example of venom as convergent evolution. That's right, convergent evolution of a venom from something over in the plant kingdom and something over in the animal kingdom that have just evolved and come to be in totally separate evolutionary trajectories. The next step for researchers to figure out is exactly how these venom peptides came to be and where, back along the line, they first actually arose. Meanwhile, my next step is to definitely not ever get stung by one. And now for the biggest life on earth, but with a question mark news of the past week, phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, or as a lot of news outlets described, life on Venus, whoa, there's life on Venus, oh my God, life on Venus. It's crazy, there's life on Venus. Yeah, not exactly. So let's actually see what's going on here. The article was published in Nature Astronomy on September 14th of 2020. The title is Phosphine Gas in the Cloud Decks of Venus. For the record, Cloud Decks of Venus is totally my new band name. TM. Moving on. Astronomers have been studying the atmospheres of rocky planets in our solar system to get clues about what might be happening on the surface. And one of the questions is whether some of the molecules found in the atmosphere can mean something about the presence of life on these planets. But let's be very clear before we go any further. When we are talking about life in this context, we're really talking about life on Earth type life. It's coming from a totally Earth-centric point of view. The only life we know is the stuff we've described and called life on our own planet. So when we talk about it for other planets, it really is more Earth-type life than it is just saying life. It's an important distinction because saying that something is alive really is very relative. All right, so gases that show signs of Earth-type life in other planets are called biosignature gases. And an ideal biosignature gas has a certain number of characteristics. It would need to come solely from living organisms on that planet, and it would need to be unambiguous, as in it could definitely be characterized and described as itself. Recently, a team proposed that if you find phosphine in the atmosphere of a rocky planet, it could be a sign of life. Phosphine gas is one phosphorus plus three hydrogens, and it's found on our own atmosphere, usually in trace amounts due to human activity and microbes. So. Phosphine might turn out to be a good biosignature gas. And the big news here is that this research team found phosphine in the upper level clouds of the atmosphere of Venus. 
But where did it come from? Obviously, that was the big question. You know, was it a gas reaction? Was it a chemical reaction? Was it something we absolutely don't know about at all, but doesn't have to do with life? Or is it something else entirely? The presence of phosphine was totally unexpected. So the team, in their words, reviewed all scenarios that could possibly create phosphine given established knowledge of Venus. Welp, most of the scenarios got ruled out, and there was no chemical reaction explanation for the presence and the amount of phosphine that this team found in the atmosphere of Venus. And what that left them with was some possibly other unknown reaction or possibly life. But the results still need to be confirmed. This was a one-time thing, and the researchers were quick to point out that absolutely another team would need to find this same thing. What's most important, and what might have got missed in some of the headlines about this paper, is the following. Even if confirmed, we emphasize that the detection of phosphine is not robust evidence for life, only for anomalous and unexplained chemistry. Basically, the authors recognize that Earth-type life is, yes, a possible explanation for the phosphine they found in the atmosphere of Venus, but most likely it's some other chemical reaction that we simply just don't know about yet. And there's just so much work that needs to be done to understand the inner workings of Venus and all of its mystery. Thanks for watching this episode of Nature League. The news can be a tough place to linger right now, but I hope these headlines from Life on Earth or Venus topics have given you some hope and inspiration to keep adapting and keep going through day to day. Hang in there and make sure to subscribe and check back for the episode we're going to do about the UN's newest biodiversity assessment. Until then, take care and stay safe. Life on Earth is amazing and so are you. And so is Jane, but mainly Jane. She's right there. You wanna see her? Here. We're just gonna, we're just gonna pan this. We're just gonna pan this over. We're just gonna pan this over to, there she is. Yeah, I built her a little shelf. That's a thing. She was there the whole time, the whole time.